a little later than usual tonight because I had a very, very tiring day at work. Um, I actually planned to start normal time, but I, uh, after dinner, literally just fell asleep, <laughs> which uh, tells you something. But uh, we want get, to get, uh, get into our world building for tonight, so let's go ahead and do that. And because tonight we're going to talk about money. I think it's easy for folks to either dismiss money or to um, think about it a little too simply. So let's let's think a little bit here. Um, money, um, money versus barter. So our first question is: In your society, the society you're building assuming that we are doing some world building here, is you can just barter. You can just trade goods back and forth uh, instead of using some kind of currency. This is problematic, as you can imagine, in terms of just being inefficient. Um, if I, you know, if the things I have to barter are of similar value, that's easy. But often the things that we have are not of easy and similar value. Um, a furniture maker can make a piece of furniture, but then needs a dozen eggs. And that chair is worth way more than a dozen eggs. So how do you handle that and keep track of uh, what is actually owed? And so in that case, you can imagine um, the furniture maker might go to a farmer and say, here's a chair. Now let's write out a little IOU that says, I have given you a chair, and in return, you will give me um, eggs and vegetables for the next three months, for example. And indeed, that is how money got started. In many societies, it was simply a, um, um, a record of goods transferred that were worth more than, um, uh, than other goods. And so you had this little piece of paper saying, Basically, um, I am owed this particular amount of money. And then people realized, well, that piece of paper um, is a lot more convenient to, to, to keep track of than other things. And in fact, back in the day, um, <coughs> um, essentially bar tabs or, or tabs were, were built using sticks. So you can imagine um, taking a, a stick, and I'm going to grab a, uh, a popsicle stick here. If I can open the bag, it doesn't want to open for me. Okay. And uh, we'll pretend here that I've taken a single stick and broken it into two pieces, like that. Because uh, when you do that, actually we may have, do I do, one second. So imagine I have a stick like this, and I'm going to use this to record a transaction, where I'm going to say, okay, um, uh, you know, this is worth a certain amount of of uh, of transactions. So let's say I go to a a bar or a restaurant, a tavern. Um, and I tell, and I, I say, okay, I'm going to give you a chicken. And in return for that chicken, this is worth six meals, let's say. And so we have a stick, and we break that stick in half. It doesn't want to break. What do I have? That would... Okay, so we're going to pretend this breaks into two pieces, right? Um, one of the interesting things about wood is that when it splits... It tends to split in a unique manner. And I'm going to put a little bit more on this, this thing. It has to be natural as part of the problem. Um, I, oh, there we go. Okay. So, we've broken our stick into two halves. And again, we have this interesting property that these two halves combine in a very specific way. Another stick broken um, will not combine quite like that. So what we can take these sticks and say, okay, 
you know, yes, we owe that, and now I have bought a single meal, or I have provided a single meal as a result of this, and so you strike across the stick, across the, the breaking point, and then I take one, and the tavern owner takes the other, and this is now a record of how much we've uh, we have uh, spent essentially, you know, how far along we are on that particular transaction. So we know, okay, we have one thing bought, and we could very easily, as you can imagine, write on this. names so we know who th this stick refers to and you know the transaction this is this is um, this is referring to and so each person has their own part of the stick you come back together and say okay let's continue with this transaction and this becomes a simple form of money um, you can further imagine somebody going up to somebody and saying hey you know, I've got a a chicken. Um, you know, I give it to you. What if we just use a stick to keep track of this transaction? Um, you know, um, or I could, for example, take my piece of the stick and go to somebody else and say, um, you know, I've caught a bunch of fish. I don't need um food from the restaurant but i want what you have you can have my part of the stick right so this is a a signifier of wealth you can then transfer back and forth and so once you have that then you you know these are some of these signifiers of wealth um the sticks themselves and then you transfer from that to coins and to paper money um coins originally most of the time were signifiers or were um, um, actually contained valuable metal. So, you know, there was a little bit of silver in a silver coin. <coughs> there was copper in a, a copper coin, often quite a bit of it. So um, that money actually represented some real physical value. And indeed, uh, back in the day, a... Um, a nation would back all of its money with a certain amount of an actual material, often gold. So you could always trade in your money for actual gold and a, a, a actual valuable commodity. Um, as time has evolved, we've discovered and realized that that is actually not necessary. Um, you know, because everyone trusts the system, uh, and everybody assigns value to money. Um, trading it in for gold is academic. You know, that money has value, you know, regardless of whether you can sell the gold. The gold isn't inherently valuable any more than the money is, in the sense that you know, if, if, if all people died tomorrow, you know, a, a bar of gold doesn't do, anyone any, doesn't, doesn't do anything any, any good. So why should the paper money be treated as a second-class citizen? or coinage. So, what is your monetary system? Uh, what do you trade back and forth? Again, you can use you can use sticks, you can use coins, you can use pretty much anything. There is a an island nation that uses giant statues, giant stone statues, uh, as a monetary system. Everyone just owns parts of those stone statues, and everyone just knows who owns how much of each one, and that is your wealth. And you can buy more of each statue, uh, and so you can't, you know, uh, um, take one to the market, but you can say, I, you know, I am the person who owns two statues worth of, of wealth, and I will give you a quarter of a statue for this thing. And that's how, you know, everything gets traded back and forth. Um, so you can be really wild with your monetary system. That is, in practice, a, uh, an impractical system really hard to, to, to make that make sense. But, you know, um, you don't have to be afraid of doing a really weird system. In most Earth societies, we have coins 
and we have paper money. Although these days it, that's, it's barely paper anymore. It's often um, cotton and other materials that are used. <coughs> Not very important. Um, why do we have coins and paper? Because they're easy to, to transport. Um, you can count them easily and you can uh, transact with them easily. Um, uh, coins are easy to, to weigh and thus easy to measure um, size and such. Particularly in an industrial society, well, things like vending machines you know, rely on the size and shape and weight of coins to be effective. Um, and paper money can be of any, any denomination. So you can have a, um, you know, you, you can carry a lot of, of monetary value in a single bill that is worth $10,000, for example. Um, so those are all things worth thinking about. And also, money tends towards efficiency. Um, one reason that you don't see a lot of really um, bizarre and complicated monetary systems in the sense that, you know, you have coins and paper and bricks and all different things used um, for, for currency is that uh, it's easy to cheat uh, if there are less understood methods of currency and it is harder to um, uh, trade with different uh, kinds of currency. If the whole idea of currency is to simplify the barter system, why would you then have 15 different kinds of currency objects, uh, some of which are not going to be as well understood? So they tend to be you know, simple and, and very easy to understand. Now that said, and this is an important thing that I think a lot of folks get, get wrong, is that we're used to modern society, especially Americans, we're used to living in a very large country where everyone uses the same monetary system. Um, and even folks living in relatively smaller countries, um, you're used to a world where pretty much everyone you know uses the same money. Back in the Middle Ages, for example, um, you would often come across people using different monetary coinage from different places. So you would have florins and francs and um, shillings um, it, all in the same till box, so to speak. Now, obviously, if you're getting way up in the north of England, for example, you're not going to see that, that as much. But people were much more used to having a lot of different uh, uh, coinages and then being able to transfer back and forth uh, between them, especially as the world became more uh, metropolitan. So if your civilization is one where a lot of societies are all um, melting together, they're sort of a melting pot, you should expect to see multiple monetary systems in place and people uh, transferring money between those two. And that can be a rich source of conflict. If you have a lot of money in um, uh, a particular nation's currency and you go to war with that nation, Something may become very difficult for you to use that money in your current nation. And so folks now need to do something with that money. They may need to get that money out of the country. So you can do some really fun things with money. Um, especially if that money is relatively easy, easy to transport in the case of like bills. Now bills are um, something you generally don't see until you have much more industrialized societies. Because... It's easier to forge um, paper money, so you tend to you tend to need fairly high tech to um, to have effective paper money to be able to print money um, at scale, but also with detail that cannot be easily forged by people. Uh, especially because again, one of the one of the advantages of paper money is being able to have a lot of value in a single bill. Um, it is thus very attractive for counterfeiters to forge that. And then again, that becomes a, an interesting plot point, potentially, of having people who are forging currency. Uh, money also brings with it a whole host of other elements in society. So let's, let's write these things down. Um, um, coinage versus paper bills. Um, you will often have multiple currencies in place. Um, money brings with it things like exchanges between different currency systems. 
uh, and it brings with it the um, the problem of storage. You, know, you can lose money. Now you can lose a chicken too, but generally speaking, in an agrarian society, um, while you can suffer losses because money kind of coalesces a lot of value in a very small space, because you have you know, all of your money in one little coin box. Um, if something happens to that, a lot of value is suddenly destroyed. Whereas if you have a fire, again, that's very bad, but generally speaking, you know, your cow and your chicken are going to get out of there. You know, you're, it's not necessarily going to burn your entire place down or your, your entire um, farm down. Um, whereas money can be um, a, a much bigger deal. And it is much easier to track and easier to count. Um, also, importantly, uh, money is generally how governments run. It is very hard to run a government on taxes of corn or rice, uh, although it can be done. Japan did for centuries. But generally speaking, it's a lot easier to just ask for money in, in, in taxes as opposed to essentially a tithe of some percentage of your goods. So governments often will tend to uh, promote money because it's just a simpler way of, of running things. So, um, governments, governments prefer money over goods for taxes. Similarly, and, and uh, religion is a little more complicated because similarly to, to governments, a religion finds money easier to transact with, but religions tend to be against hoarding of money. They need to be much more suspicious of money. So they often have prohibitions against um, um, people of the cloth, if you will, of the religion, um, getting, you know, taking in a lot of money. While they may take money in as say, a tithing, that is expected to be then dispersed to the church and kind of used in other ways. Uh, the person taking the money is not, not supposed to get rich. In the Middle Ages, again, this is a big uh, bone of contention because monasteries, for example, often became very rich. Um, same thing in actually uh, Japan and China, where monasteries would be beneficiaries of huge cash donations, and they would kind of live the high life compared to the regular pe person, which wasn't really the, the purpose, the, the spirit, if you will, of those institutions. And as a result, there was a lot of um, uh, public outcry against it, but also internal outcry religiously, where other priests would condemn monasteries that had these, you know, these very ostentatious, these very uh, rich surroundings, and and uh, uh, you know where they're you know, they're eating uh, expensive food all the time. So um, religion often uh, prefers money. Um, I will call them tithes, whatever the your society calls them, um, but is very suspicious of religious people who are of, of wealthy, of, well, we'll call it religious wealth, right? Not that, it, not that it doesn't happen, but there tends to be more social unrest around that, more people complaining about it, both inside and outside of that religious institution. <coughs> so again, we're thinking about. Another uh, important thing, thing to think about there is how you make money. And if you have coins, that means you have metal. You can have wooden coins and other things like that. Um, but if you have metal coins, that metal has to come from somewhere. So that, that uh, you know, implies a certain level of, uh, of, of trade. All right. So let's apply these to our settings. We have our verdant caravans. Let's think about that. So we have a lot of people moving around. Um, we might go with like a, a stick-based environment where people are, um, where money is more contractual, where it's more about a, a thing you're promising somebody else. Um, maybe they have, maybe you have like wooden tokens that represent value. Um, and because people are kind of traveling together 
uh, and they're seeing each other occasionally um, um, in, the, in their rounds, you're going to have more trust, if you will, right? Because you know, you, you're living with the people in your, in your caravan. You're meeting folks in, um, you know, on a farm every year, a couple times a year, maybe even. So um, you don't need a highly rigorous process for proving that your wealth is, um, uh, is accurate. But you want something to, to record, to, to remind you of that. So I'm going to say that um, sticks um, and wooden, uh, we'll call them, um, uh, discs are used for money. If a person owes um, some value, a flat stick is split down the middle and transactions recorded as marks across the stick, crossing the split. Something of significant value. Um, wooden tokens are also used as simple um, um, uh, coins. We'll just call it that. So, if you have something that's not a direct, um, a direct transaction with somebody else, where it's not, I have done this service for you, and thus this is marking off the the payback, if you will. You just want to say, hey, you know, we're we're coming into town. We need to pay for a meal. Here's a wooden token in in, um, uh, in response to that. I think that's going to make sense. And the wooden tokens, um, we're going to say, um, complicated patterns are burned into the tokens to represent their relative value. Um, and that is what makes them kind of unique and valuable, so to speak. You know, it's not just, you can't just go into the woods, chop up a stick, and cut it into pieces, and thus you, know, you have a bunch of, of value. You need to be able to replicate these exact um, um, symbols and these exact patterns to create a coin, so to speak. Um, we might even say that um, uh, these pattern, um, some of these patterns, patterns are caravan specific. So certain caravans more or less print their own money. In that sense, the big ones might have a uh, a way of saying, okay, we we we've, we've we've gathered these fruits, we've done this this useful thing. So that is worth a certain amount of, of coins. We're gonna or these tokens. We're gonna have them created. Um, in our communist ranches, uh, with a lot of metal, um, we're gonna say metal coins and bars are used as money. Um, People prefer to use metal for money with bars for higher value. Um, other monetary systems simply haven't taken off. Um, and we have this very metallic <coughs> Central Island. I think there is a... Um, there is a money makers guild that operates on the main island, main volcanic island, and they are the only ones um, licensed to make money. Each island's government contracts with them to create, to um, make coins, right? So that's all controlled that way, uh, and all of that's going to be a central organization, which then implies some neat plot potential, where the, that the, that money makers guild um, might have created a new coinage for a an island that falls into civil war, and the government collapses, and so now there's this new there, there's this shipment of coin that comes in, 
that um, the government can't pay for, right? Because it's, it's bankrupt now. What happens to that coinage? Um, you could grab that and melt it down. You could do all sorts of interesting stuff with it. Um, also, we'll say um, um, metal itself is highly valued, and so coinage is often um, is uh, is often melted down um, and used for barter by more um, by the more unscrupulous segments of the population. Getting paid by the word there. <coughs> so I like this idea that metal is is um, valued perhaps even more than its actual worth, right? So and we're talking about like you know gold and silver and things like that. People just really want gold and silver, um, uh, both as necklaces and things like that. In fact, um, again, back in the old days, often uh, people would have necklaces and bracelets as forms of long-term value, right? If you were um, a, a, a merchant, for example, and you built up significant wealth, how do you take that with you? If you just take it as a bunch of coins, that's easy to get robbed. If you have a necklace made of it and wear it around your neck, it's harder for that to be just stolen one night because you keep it with you at all times. You know, they'd have to like, literally murder you. So that is one effective way of, of keeping value. Now, let's, let's say that. Um, metal, um, precious metal itself is highly valued, especially for jewelry that, oops, jewelry that um, holds a lot of a family's wealth. So coin is often melted down used for barter and used for barter or the making of jewelry in the population. So yeah, so I think metal is going to be one of those things people really, um, precious metals, uh, people make jewelry out of and uh, people are always looking for more sources of precious metals. And you're going to see some of those things be, uh, be, uh, anonymized, if you will, right? And it, it can go the other direction, where somebody has a a necklace made of gold with a jewel in it, uh, which is very well known. People know what that that is. They know what house that belongs to. If someone steals that, they will immediately melt it down and turn it into something completely different. You know, two bracelets, and that way you don't know where that came from. So. I like that idea. That, that creates an interesting sort of um, social aspect. But you have the, these coins minted and processed through. People just really like that, 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 the shiny metal of coinage. All right, I think that will do for us for tonight for these monetary systems. Um, that is our world building for this week. And we'll be back next week with a little bit more about uh, other things to think about in terms of building a world. Until next time. <coughs> <coughs> Um, may you create some interesting worlds.